A gender role, also known as a sex role, is a social role encompassing a range of behaviors and attitudes that are generally considered acceptable, appropriate, or desirable for people based on their actual or perceived sex or sexuality. Gender roles are usually centered on conceptions of femininity and masculinity, although there are exceptions and variations. The specifics regarding these gendered expectations may vary substantially among cultures, while other characteristics may be common throughout a range of cultures. There is ongoing debate as to what extent gender roles and their variations are biologically determined, and to what extent they are socially constructed. Various groups, most notably the feminist movement, have led efforts to change aspects of prevailing gender roles that they believe are oppressive or inaccurate. The term gender role was first used by John Money and colleagues in 1954, during the course of his study of intersex individuals, to describe the manners in which these individuals express their status as a male or female in a situation where no clear biological assignment existed. Topic. Background The World Health Organization WHO defines gender roles as socially constructed roles, behaviors, activities and attributes that a given society considers appropriate for men and women." Debate continues as to what extent gender and gender roles are socially constructed i.e. non-biologically influenced, and to what extent, "...socially constructed," may be considered synonymous with, "...arbitrary," or "...malleable." Therefore, a concise authoritative definition of gender roles or gender itself is elusive. In the sociology of gender, the process whereby an individual learns and acquires a gender role in society is termed gender socialization. Some systems of classification, unlike whose, are non binary or genderqueer, allowing for more than two possible gender classifications. Gender roles are culturally specific, and while some cultures distinguish only two boy and girl or man and woman, others recognize more. Androgyny, for example, has been proposed as a third gender. Androgynous is simply a person with qualities pertaining to both the male and female gender. Other societies have claimed to identify more than five genders, and some non-Western societies have three genders, man, woman, and third gender. Some individuals not necessarily being from such a culture identify with no gender at all. Many transgender people reject the idea that they are a separate third gender, and identify simply as men or women. However, biological differences between some trans women and cisgender women have historically been treated as relevant in certain contexts, such as sport. Gender role, which refers to the cultural expectations as understood by gender classification, is not the same thing as gender identity, which refers to the internal sense of one's own gender, whether or not it aligns with categories offered by societal norms. The point at which these internalized gender identities become externalized into a set of expectations is the genesis of a gender role. Women were not granted the right to vote in many parts of the world until the 19th or 20th centuries, and some women were not granted a vote well into the 21st century. Women throughout the world, in many ways, do not enjoy full freedom and protection under the law. See women's rights. Feminist researchers have theorized it was in fact the creation of law in the ancient state-making process that initiated and normalized patriarchal principles and gender inequalities. Due to the prevailing perception of men as primarily breadwinners, they are seldom afforded the benefit of paternity leave. However, for some individuals gender roles may provide a positive effect, and their absence may prove difficult. While gender roles may be used as deleterious gender stereotypes, they can offer a clear avenue to verify and structure socially acceptable behavior. Additionally, fulfilling one's prescribed gender roles has been correlated with increased self-esteem, and vice versa. As Kelsey Beckham, who self-identifies as gender neutral, phrased it, it just makes me feel separated from society, when we have to keep talking about it. It's like, am I even human? I mean, I know I'm not normal. Topic. Theories of gender as a social construct Some theories, which are collectively termed social construction theories, claim that gender behavior is mostly due to social conventions, although opposing theories disagree, such as theories in evolutionary psychology. Most children learn to categorize themselves by gender by the age of three. From birth, in the course of gender socialization, children learn gender stereotypes and roles from their parents and environment. 
In a traditional view, males learn to manipulate their physical and social environment through physical strength or dexterity, while girls learn to present themselves as objects to be viewed. Social constructionists state, for example, that gender-segregated children's activities create the appearance that gender differences in behavior reflect an essential nature of male and female behavior. As an aspect of role theory, gender role theory treats these differing distributions of women and men into roles as the primary origin of sex differentiated social behavior. Their impact on behavior is mediated by psychological and social processes. According to Gilbert Hurt, gender roles arose from correspondent inference, meaning that general labor division was extended to gender roles. Socially constructed gender roles are considered to be hierarchical, and are characterized as a male advantage gender hierarchy by social constructionists. The term patriarchy, according to researcher Andrew Sherlin, defines a social order based on the domination of women by men, especially in agricultural societies. According to Eagley et al., the consequences of gender roles and stereotypes are sex-typed social behavior because roles and stereotypes are both socially shared descriptive norms and prescriptive norms. Judith Butler, in works such as Gender Trouble and Undoing Gender, contends that being female is not natural and that it appears natural only through repeated performances of gender. These performances in turn reproduce and define the traditional categories of sex and or gender. Topic. Talcott Parsons Working in the United States, Talcott Parsons developed a model of the nuclear family in 1955, which at that place and time was the prevalent family structure. It compared a strictly traditional view of gender roles from an industrial age American perspective with a more liberal view. The Parsons model was used to contrast and illustrate extreme positions on gender roles. Model A describes total separation of male and female roles, while Model B describes the complete dissolution of gender roles. The examples are based on the context of the culture and infrastructure of the United States. However, these structured positions become less a liberal individualist society, and the actual behavior of individuals is usually somewhere between these poles. According to the interactionist approach, roles including gender roles are not fixed but are constantly negotiated between individuals. In North America and Southern South America, this is the most common approach among families whose business is agriculture. Gender roles can influence all kinds of behaviors, such as choice of clothing, choice of work and personal relationships, e.g., parental status see also sociology of fatherhood. Geert Hofstede Geert Hofstede, a Dutch researcher and social psychologist who dedicated himself to the study of culture, sees culture as broad patterns of thinking, feeling and acting. In a society in Hofstede's view, masculinity and femininity differ in the social roles that are associated with the biological fact of the existence of the two sexes. Masculinity and femininity refer to the dominant sex role pattern in the vast majority of both traditional and modern societies, males being more assertive and females more nurturing. Femininity creates a society of overlapping gender roles, where both men and women are supposed to be modest, tender, and concerned with the quality of life. Masculinity creates a society of clearly distinct gender roles, where men should be assertive, tough, and focused on material success, while women should be more modest, tender, and concerned with the quality of life. Hofstede's feminine and masculine culture dimensions states, Masculine cultures expect men to be assertive, ambitious and competitive, to strive for material success, and to respect whatever is big, strong, and fast. Masculine cultures expect women to serve and care for the non-material quality of life, for children and for the weak. Feminine cultures, on the other hand, define relatively overlapping social roles for the sexes, in which, in particular, men need not be ambitious or competitive but may go for a different quality of life than material success. Men may respect whatever is small, weak, and slow. In feminine cultures, modesty and relationships are important characteristics. This differs from in masculine cultures, where self-enhancement leads to self-esteem. Masculine cultures are individualistic, and feminine cultures are more collective because of the significance of personal relationships. The dominant values in a masculine society are achievement and success, the dominant values in a feminine society are caring for others and quality of life. 
Topic: <laughs> Albert Ellis. In the 1940s, Albert Ellis studied 84 cases of mixed births and concluded that while the power of the human sex drive may possibly be largely dependent on physiological factors, the direction of this drive does not seem to be directly dependent on constitutional element. In the development of masculinity, femininity, and inclinations towards homosexuality or heterosexuality, nurture matters a great deal more than nature. John Money In the 1950s, John Money, along with colleagues took up the study of intersex individuals, who, Money realized, would provide invaluable material for the comparative study for bodily form and physiology, rearing, and psychosexual orientation. Money and his colleagues used their own studies to state in the extreme what these days seems extraordinary for its complete denial of the notion of natural inclination. They concluded that gonads, hormones, and chromosomes did not automatically determine a child's gender role. Among the many terms he coined was gender role which he defined in a seminal 1955 paper as all those things that a person says or does to disclose himself or herself as having the status of boy or man, girl or woman." In recent years, the majority of Money's theories regarding the importance of socialization in the determination of gender have come under intense criticism, especially in connection with the false reporting of success in the John, Joan case, later revealed to be David Reimer. <laughs> Candace West and Don H. Zimmerman equals 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 West and Zimmerman developed an interactionist perspective on gender beyond its construction as roles. For them, gender is the product of social doings of some sort undertaken by men and women whose competence as members of society is hostage to its production. They argue that the use of role to describe gender expectations conceals the production of gender through everyday activities. Furthermore, roles are situated identities, such as nurse and student, developed as the situation demands while gender is a master identity with no specific site or organizational context. For them, conceptualizing gender as a role makes it difficult to assess its influence on other roles and reduces its explanatory usefulness in discussions of power and inequality. West and Zimmerman consider gender an individual production that reflects and constructs interactional and institutional gender expectations. Biological factors Because of the influence of Simone de Beauvoir's feminist works and Michel Foucault's reflections on sexuality among others, the idea that gender was unrelated to sex gained ground during the 1980s, especially in sociology and cultural anthropology. This view asserts that the relationship between gender and sex presence of genitals, gonads, is not causally determinate. That is, that one may have the genitals of one sex while having the gender of another, there continues to be debate on the subject. Simon Baron Cohen, a Cambridge University professor of psychology and psychiatry claims the female brain is predominantly hardwired for empathy, while the male brain is predominantly hardwired for understanding and building systems. However, Nash and Grossi describe his study of newborns as fraught with methodological problems. Several studies have been conducted looking at the gender roles of intersex children. One such study looked at female infants with adrenal hyperplasia, and who had excess male hormone levels, but were thought to be females and raised as such by their parents. These girls were more likely to express masculine traits. Another study looked at 18 infants with the intersex condition 5 alpha reductase deficiency, and XY chromosomes, assigned female at birth. At adult age only one individual maintained a female role, all the others being stereotypically male. In a third study, 14 male children born with cloacal extrophy and assigned female at birth, including through intersex medical interventions. Upon follow-up between the ages of 5 to 12, eight of them identified as boys, and all of the subjects had at least moderately male typical attitudes and interests. Dr. Sandra Lipsitz Bem is a psychologist who developed the gender schema theory, based on the combination of aspects of the social learning theory and the cognitive development theory of sex role acquisition, to explain how individuals come to use gender as an organizing category in all aspects of their life. 
In 1971, she created the BEM Sex Role Inventory to measure how well an individual conformed to a traditional gender role, characterizing those tested as having masculine, feminine, androgynous, or indifferentiated personality. She believed that through gender schematic processing, a person spontaneously sorts attributes and behaviors into masculine and feminine categories, and that therefore individuals processes information and regulate their behavior based on whatever definitions of femininity and masculinity their culture provides, while there are differences in average capabilities of various kinds e.g. better average balance in females or greater average physical size and endurance in males between the sexes the capabilities of some members of one sex will fall within the range of capabilities needed for tasks conventionally assigned to the other sex. Eve Shapiro, author of Gender Circuits, explains that Gender, like other social categories, is both a personal identity and a culture set of behaviors, beliefs and values. Research at the Yerkes National Primate Research Center has also shown that gender roles may be biological among primates. Yerkes researchers studied the interactions of 11 male and 23 female rhesus monkeys with human toys, both wheeled and plush. The males played mostly with the wheeled toys while the females played with both types equally. Study co-author Kim Wallen has, however, warned against overinterpreting the results as the color and size of the toys may also have been factors. Culture Ideas of appropriate behavior according to gender vary among cultures and era, although some aspects receive more widespread attention than others. R. W. Connell in Men, Masculinities and Feminism claims, there are cultures where it has been normal, not exceptional, for men to have homosexual relations. There have been periods in Western history when the modern convention that men suppress displays of emotion did not apply at all, when men were demonstrative about their feeling for their friends. Mateship in the Australian outback last century is a case in point. There are huge aerial differences in attitudes towards appropriate gender roles. In the World Values Survey, responders were asked if they thought that wage work should be restricted to only men in the case of shortage in jobs. In Iceland, the proportion that agreed with the proposition was 3.6%, while in Egypt it was 94.9%. Attitudes have also varied historically. For example, in Europe, during the Middle Ages, women were commonly associated with roles related to medicine and healing. Because of the rise of witch hunts across Europe and the institutionalization of medicine, these roles became exclusively associated with men but in the last few decades these roles have become largely gender neutral in Western society. Vern Bullough stated that homosexual communities are generally more tolerant of switching gender roles. For instance, someone with a masculine voice, a five o'clock shadow or a fuller beard, an Adam's apple, wearing a woman's dress and high heels, carrying a purse would most likely draw ridicule or other unfriendly attention in ordinary social contexts, because the dominant class sees this form of gender expression as unacceptable, inappropriate, or perhaps threatening. These individuals are significantly more likely to experience discrimination and harassment both in their personal lives and from their employer, according to a 2011 report from the Center for American Progress, gender roles may be a means through which one expresses their gender identity, but they may also be employed as a means of exerting social control, and individuals may experience negative social consequences for violating them. Religion Different religious and cultural groups within one country may have different norms that they attempt to police within their own group, including gender norms. Topic. Christianity 1 Corinthians, 11 14 and 15 indicates that it is inappropriate for a man to wear his hair long, and good for a woman to wear her hair long. The roles of women in Christianity can vary considerably today as they have varied historically since the 1st century New Testament Church. This is especially true in marriage and informal ministry positions within certain Christian denominations, churches, and parachurch organizations. Many leadership roles in the organized church have been restricted to males. In the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches, only men may serve as priests or deacons, only males serve in senior leadership positions such as pope, patriarch, and bishop. Women may serve as abbesses. Most mainstream Protestant denominations are beginning to relax their long-standing constraints on ordaining women to be ministers, though some large groups are tightening their constraints in reaction. 
Charismatic and Pentecostal churches have embraced the ordination of women since their founding. Christian traditions that officially recognize saints as persons of exceptional holiness of life having attained the beatific vision heaven, do list women in that group. Most prominent is Mary, mother of Jesus who is highly revered throughout Christianity, particularly in the Catholic and Orthodox churches where she is considered the Theotokos, i.e., Mother of God, the Son born of her, Jesus, being God incarnate, that is, both God and man. Women prominent in Christianity have included contemporaries of Jesus, subsequent theologians, abbesses, mystics, doctors of the church, founders of religious orders, military leaders, monarchs and martyrs, evidencing the variety of roles played by women within the life of Christianity. Paul the Apostle held women in high regard and worthy of prominent positions in the church, though he was careful not to encourage disregard for the New Testament household codes, also known as New Testament domestic codes or haustaphalon, of Greco-Roman law in the first century. <laughs> Islam In the United Arab Emirates, non-Muslim Western women can wear crop tops, whereas Muslim women are expected to dress much more modestly, due to the injunction on women in Islam to dress modestly at all times when in public. In some Muslim countries, these differences are sometimes even codified in law. In some Muslim-majority countries, however, even non-Muslim women are expected to follow Muslim female gender norms and Islamic law to a certain extent, such as by covering their hair. This norm may sometimes be objected to by women visiting from other countries, but they may nevertheless decide to comply on pragmatic grounds, in the interests of their own safety. For example, in Egypt, women who do not dress modestly, whether they are Muslims or not, may be perceived to be akin to prostitutes by men. Muhammad described the high status of mothers in both of the major hadith collections Bukhari and Muslim. One famous account is a man asked the Prophet, Whom should I honor most? The Prophet replied, Your mother, and who comes next? asked the man. The Prophet replied, Your mother. And who comes next? asked the man. The Prophet replied, Your mother. And who comes next? asked the man. The Prophet replied, Your father. In Muslim culture, women are seen as having a similar status to men, however, men are seen as a degree above women according to the Quran. How gender roles are honored is largely cultural. While some cultures encourage men and women to take on the same roles, others promote a more traditional, less dominant role for the women. <inaudible> Hinduism Hindu deities are more ambiguously gendered than deities of other world religions, such as Christianity, Islam, and others. This informs female and male's relations, and informs how the differences between males and females are understood however, in a religious cosmology like Hinduism, which prominently features female and androgynous deities, some gender transgression is allowed. This group is known as the Hiras, and has a long tradition of performing in important rituals, such as the birth of sons and weddings. Despite this allowance for transgression, Hindu cultural traditions portray women in contradictory ways. On one hand, women's fertility is given great value, and on the other, female sexuality is depicted as potentially dangerous and destructive. <inaudible> <inaudible> Studies on marriage in the U.S. Marriage is an institution that influences gender roles, inequality, and change. In the United States, gender roles are communicated by the media, social interaction, and language. Through these platforms society has influenced individuals to fulfill the stereotypical gender roles within a heterosexual marriage starting out at a young age. Although traditionally, society claims that roles within a heterosexual marriage should be decided based on one's biological sex, today individuals are determining their own roles for themselves, ultimately creating equal partnerships. Topic. Communication of gender roles in the United States In the U.S., marriage roles are generally decided based on gender. For approximately the past seven decades, heterosexual marriage roles have been defined for men and women based on society's expectations and the influence of the media. Men and women are typically associated with certain social roles dependent upon the personality traits associated with those roles. Traditionally, the role of the homemaker is associated with a woman and the role of a breadwinner is associated with a male. 
Typically, women are concerned with caring for the family and the home while men are typically providing for the family. This ultimately portrays the man as a leader and the woman as the follower. In the U.S., single men are outnumbered by single women at a ratio of 100 single women to 86 single men, though never married men over the age of 15 outnumber women by a 5 to 4 ratio 33.9% to 27.3% according to the 2006 U.S. Census American Community Survey. The results are varied between age groups, with 118 single men per 100 single women in their 20s, versus 33 single men to 100 single women over 65. The numbers also vary between countries. For example, China has many more young men than young women, and this disparity is expected to increase. In regions with recent conflict such as Chechnya, women greatly outnumber men. In a cross cultural study by David Buss, men and women were asked to rank the importance of certain traits in a long term partner. Both men and women ranked kindness and intelligence as the two most important factors. Men valued beauty and youth more highly than women, while women valued financial and social status more highly than men. Topic. Media In today's society, media saturates nearly every aspect of one's life. It seems inevitable for society to be influenced by the media and what it is portraying. Roles are gendered, meaning that both males and females are viewed and treated differently according to their biological sex, and because gendered roles are learned, the media has a direct impact on individuals. Thinking about the way in which couples act on romantic television shows or movies and the way women are portrayed as passive in magazine ads, reveals a lot about how gender roles are viewed in society and in heterosexual marriages. Traditional gendered roles view the man as a procreator, a protector, and a provider, and the woman as pretty and polite but not too aggressive, not too outspoken and not too smart. Media aids in society conforming to these traditional gendered views. People learn through imitation and social interaction both in the physical world and through the media, television, magazines, advertisements, newspapers, the internet, etc. Michael Messner argues that, "...gendered interactions, structure, and cultural meanings are intertwined, in both mutually reinforcing and contradictory ways." Television's influence on society, specifically the influence of television advertisements, is shown in studies such as that of Jorg Mathies, Michael Prieller, and Caroline Adam. Their study into television advertising has shown that women are much more likely to be shown in a setting in the home compared to men. The study also shows that women are shown much less in work-like settings. This underrepresentation in television advertising is seen in many countries around the world but is very present in developed countries. In another study in the Journal of Social Psychology, many television advertisements in countries around the world are seen targeting women at different times of the day than men. Advertisements for products directed towards female viewers are shown during the day on weekdays, while products for men are shown during weekends. The same article shows that a study on adults and television media has also seen that the more television adults watch, the more likely they are to believe or support the gender roles that are illustrated. The support of the presented gender stereotypes can lead to a negative view of feminism or sexual aggression. It has been presented in the journal article by Emerald Group Publishing Limited that adolescent girls have been affected by the stereotypical view of women in media. Girls feel pressurized and stressed to achieve a particular appearance and there have been highly worrying consequences for the young girls if they fail to achieve this look. These consequences have ranged from anxiety to eating disorders. Young girls in an experiment of this journal article describe pictures on women in advertisements as unrealistic and fake. They are dressed in little and revealing clothing which sexualize the women and expose their thin figures, that are gazed upon by the public, creating an issue with stereotyping in the media. It has also been presented that children are affected by gender roles in the media. Children's preferences in television characters are most likely to be to characters of the same gender. Because children favor characters of the same gender, the characteristics of the character are also looked to by children. In another journal article by Emerald Group Publishing Limited, the underrepresentation of women in children's television shows between 1930 and 1960 is examined. While studies between 1960 and 1990 show an increase in the representation of women in television, studies conducted between 1990 and 2005, a time when women were considered to be equal to men by some, show no change in the representation of women in children's television shows. 
Women, being underrepresented in children's television shows, are also often portrayed as married or in a relationship, while men are more likely to be single. This reoccurring theme in relationship status can be reflected in the ideals of children that only see this type of representation. Topic. Social interaction Gendered roles in heterosexual marriages are learned through imitation. People learn what society views as appropriate gender behaviors from imitating the repetition of actions by one's role model or parent of the same biological sex. Imitation in the physical world that impacts one's gendered roles often comes from role modeling parents, peers, teachers, and other significant figures in one's life. In a marriage, oftentimes each person's gendered roles are determined by their parents. If the wife grew up imitating the actions of traditional parents, and the husband non-traditional parents, their views on marital roles would be different. One way people can acquire these stereotypical roles through a reward and punishment system. When a little girl imitates her mother by performing the traditional domestic duties she is often rewarded by being told she is doing a good job. Nontraditionally, if a little boy was performing the same tasks he would more likely be punished due to acting feminine. Because society holds these expected roles for men and women within a marriage, it creates a mold for children to follow. Topic. Changing gender roles in marriage Over the years, gender roles have continued to change and have a significant impact on the institution of marriage. Gender roles can be defined as the behaviors, values, and attitudes that a society considers appropriate for both male and female. Motivated by the women's rights movement and various other movements gender roles have begun to change, resulting in the changing economic landscape, women entering the workplace and many more. Traditionally, men and women had completely opposing roles, men were seen as the provider for the family and women were seen as the caretakers of both the home and the family. However, in today's society the division of roles are starting to blur. More and more individuals are adapting non-traditional gender roles into their marriage in order to share responsibilities. This revolutionary view on gender roles seeks out equality between sexes. In today's society it is more likely that a man and woman are both providers for their family. More and more women are entering the workforce while more men are contributing to household duties. Despite the fact that there is still a gap between gender roles, today, roles are less gendered and more equal in comparison to how they were traditionally. Topic. Changing roles Throughout history spouses have been charged with certain societal functions. With the rise of the new world came the expected roles that each spouse was to carry out specifically. Husbands were typically working farmers, the providers. Wives typically cared for the home and the children. However, the roles are now changing, and even reversing. Societies can change such that the gender roles rapidly change. The 21st century has seen a shift in gender roles due to multiple factors such as new family structures, education, media, and several others. A 2003 survey by the Bureau of Labor Statistics indicated that about one third of wives earn more than their husbands, with the importance of education emphasized nationwide, and the access of college degrees online, for example, women have begun furthering their education. Women have also started to get more involved in recreation activities such as sports, which in the past were regarded to be for men. Family structures are changing, and the number of single mother or single father households is increasing. Fathers are also becoming more involved with raising their children, instead of the responsibility resting solely with the mother. According to the Pew Research Center, the number of stay-at-home fathers in the U.S. nearly doubled in the period from 1989 to 2012, from 1.1 million to 2.0 million. This trend appears to be mirrored in a number of countries including the U.K., Canada and Sweden. However, Pew also found that, at least in the U.S., public opinion in general appears to show a substantial bias toward favoring a mother as a caretaker versus a father, regardless of any shift in actual roles each plays. Gender equality allows gender roles to become less distinct and according to Donalyn Pomper, is the reason. Men no longer own breadwinning identities and, like women, their bodies are objectified in mass media images. The LGBT rights movement has played a role increasing pro-gay attitudes, which according to Brian McNair, are expressed by many metrosexual men. Topic. Gender stereotype differences in cultures, East and West 
According to Professor Lei Chong, gender attitudes within the domains of work and domestic roles, can be measured using a cross-cultural gender role attitudes test. Psychological processes of the East have historically been analyzed using Western models or instruments that have been translated, which potentially, is a more far-reaching process than linguistic translation. Some North American instruments for assessing gender role attitudes include Attitudes towards women scale Sex role egalitarian scale, and Sex role ideology scale. Through such tests, it is known that American Southerners exhibit less egalitarian gender views than their Northern counterparts, demonstrating that gender views are inevitably affected by an individual's culture. This also may differ among compatriots whose cultures are a few hundred miles apart. Although existing studies have generally focused on gender views or attitudes that are work related, there has so far not been a study on specific domestic roles. Supporting Hofstede's 1980 findings, that High masculinity cultures are associated with low percentages of women holding professional and technical employment. Test values for work related egalitarianism were lower for Chinese than for Americans. This is supported by the proportion of women that held professional jobs in China, far less than that of America, the data clearly indicating the limitations on opportunities open to women in contemporary Eastern society. In contrast, there was no difference between the viewpoint of Chinese and Americans regarding domestic gender roles. A study by Richard Bogosi, Nancy Wong and Yu Jie Yi, examines the interaction between culture and gender that produces distinct patterns of association between positive and negative emotions. The United States was considered a more independence-based culture, while China was considered interdependence-based. In the U.S. people tend to experience emotions in terms of opposition whereas in China, they do so in dialectical terms i.e., those of logical argumentation and contradictory forces. The study continued with sets of psychological tests among university students in Beijing and in Michigan. The fundamental goals of the research were to show that gender differences in emotions are adaptive for the differing roles that males and females play in the culture. The evidence for differences in gender role was found during the socialization in work experiment, proving that women are socialized to be more expressive of their feelings and to show this to a greater extent in facial expressions and gestures, as well as by verbal means. The study extended to the biological characteristics of both gender groups. For a higher association between PA and NA hormones in memory for women, the cultural patterns became more evident for women than for men. Topic. Communication Gender communication is viewed as a form of intercultural communication, and gender is both an influence on and a product of communication. Communication plays a large role in the process in which people become male or female because each gender is taught different linguistic practices. Gender is dictated by society through expectations of behavior and appearances, and then is shared from one person to another, by the process of communication. Gender does not create communication, communication creates gender, for example, females are often more expressive and intuitive in their communication, but males tend to be instrumental and competitive. In addition, there are differences in accepted communication behaviors for males and females. To improve communication between genders, people who identify as either male or female must understand the differences between each gender, as found by Kara Teague McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada the importance of powerful vocal delivery for women could not be underestimated, as famously described in accounts of Margaret Thatcher's years in power. Nonverbal communication Hall published an observational study on nonverbal gender differences and discussed the cultural reasons for these differences. In her study, she noted women smile and laugh more and have a better understanding of nonverbal cues. She believed women were encouraged to be more emotionally expressive in their language, causing them to be more developed in nonverbal communication. Men, on the other hand, were taught to be less expressive, to suppress their emotions, and to be less nonverbally active in communication and more sporadic in their use of nonverbal cues. Most studies researching nonverbal communication described women as being more expressively and judgmentally accurate in nonverbal communication when it was linked to emotional expression. Other nonverbal expressions were similar or the same for both genders. McQuiston and Morris also noted a major difference in men and women's nonverbal communication. 
They found that men tend to show body language linked to dominance, like eye contact and interpersonal distance, more than women. Topic. Communication and gender cultures According to Julia Wood, there are distinct communication cultures for women and men in the U.S. Wood believes that in addition to female and male communication cultures, there are also specific communication cultures for African Americans, older people, Indian Native Americans, gay men, lesbians, and people with disabilities. According to Wood, it is generally thought that biological sex is behind the distinct ways of communicating, but in reality the root is gender. Maltz and Broker's research suggested that the games children play may contribute to socializing children into masculine and feminine gender roles, for example, girls being encouraged to play house may promote stereotypically feminine traits, and may promote interpersonal relationships as playing house does not necessarily have fixed rules or objectives. Boys tended to play more competitive and adversarial team sports with structured, predetermined goals and a range of confined strategies. Topic. Communication and sexual desire Metz, et al., explain that sexual desire is linked to emotions and communicative expression. Communication is central in expressing sexual desire and complicated emotional states, and is also the mechanism for negotiating the relationship implications of sexual activity and emotional meanings. Gender differences appear to exist in communicating sexual desire, for example, masculine people are generally perceived to be more interested in sex than feminine people, and research suggests that masculine people are more likely than feminine people to express their sexual interest. This may be greatly affected by masculine people being less inhibited by social norms for expressing their desire, being more aware of their sexual desire or succumbing to the expectation of their gender culture. When feminine people employ tactics to show their sexual desire, they are typically more indirect in nature. On the other hand, it is known masculinity is associated with aggressive behavior in all mammals, and most likely explains at least part of the fact that masculine people are more likely to express their sexual interest. This is known as the challenge hypothesis. Various studies show different communication strategies with a feminine person refusing a masculine person's sexual interest. Some research, like that of Mernon, show that when feminine people offer refusals, the refusals are verbal and typically direct. When masculine people do not comply with this refusal, feminine people offer stronger and more direct refusals. However, research from Perper and Weiss showed that rejection includes acts of avoidance, creating distractions, making excuses, departure, hinting, arguments to delay, etc. These differences in refusal communication techniques are just one example of the importance of communicative competence for both masculine and feminine gender cultures. Topic: <inaudible> Gender stereotypes. A 1992 study tested gender stereotypes and labeling within young children. The researchers divided this into two different studies. The first investigated how children identified the differences between gender labels of boys and girls. The second study looked at both gender labeling and stereotyping in the relationship of mother and child. Within the first study, 23 children between the ages of 2 and 7 underwent a series of gender labeling and gender stereotyping tests consisting of showing the children either pictures of males and females or objects such as a hammer or a broom then identifying or labeling those to a certain gender. The results of these tests showed that children under three years could make gender stereotypic associations. The second study looked at gender labeling and stereotyping in the relationship of mother and child using three separate methods. The first consisted of identifying gender labeling and stereotyping, essentially the same method as the first study. The second consisted of behavioral observations, which looked at 10-minute play sessions with mother and child using gender-specific toys. The third was a series of questionnaires such as an attitude toward women scale, personal attributes questionnaire, and Schaefer and Edgerton scale which looked at the family values of the mother. The results of these studies showed the same as the first study with regards to labeling and stereotyping. They also identified in the second method that the mother's positive reactions and responses to same-sex or opposite-sex toys played a role in how children identified them. Within the third method the results found that the mothers of the children who passed the gender labeling test, had more traditional family values. 
These two studies, conducted by Beverly I. Fago, Mar D. Leinbach and Sheree O'Boyle, showed that gender stereotyping and labeling is acquired at a very young age, and that social interactions and associations play a large role in how genders are identified. Virginia Woolf, in the 1920s, made the point, it is obvious that the values of women differ very often from the values which have been made by the other sex. Yet it is the masculine values that prevail remade 60 years later by psychologist Carol Gilligan who used it to show that psychological tests of maturity have generally been based on masculine parameters, and so tended to show that women were less mature. Gilligan countered this in her groundbreaking work, in a different voice, holding that maturity in women is shown in terms of different, but equally important, human values. Gender stereotypes are extremely common in society. One of the reasons this may be is simply because it is easier on the brain to stereotype see heuristics. The brain has limited perceptual and memory systems, so it categorizes information into fewer and simpler units which allows for more efficient information processing. Gender stereotypes appear to have an effect at an early age. In one study, the effects of gender stereotypes on children's mathematical abilities were tested. In this study of American children between the ages of 6 and 10, it was found that the children, as early as the second grade, demonstrated the gender stereotype that mathematics is a boy's subject. This may show that the mathematical self-belief is influenced before the age in which there are discernible differences in mathematical achievement. According to the 1972 study by Jean Lipman Blumen, women who grew up following traditional gender roles from childhood were less likely to want to be highly educated while women brought up with the view that men and women are equal were more likely to want higher education. This result indicates that gender roles that have been passed down traditionally can influence stereotypes about gender. In a later study, Doe and her colleagues 1984 found that most people think women are more nurturant, but less self-assertive than men, and that this belief is indicated universally, but that this awareness is related to women's role. To put it another way, women do not have an inherently nurturant personality, rather that a nurturing personality is acquired by whoever happens to be doing the housework. In a study of gender stereotypes by Jacobs 1991, it was found that parents' stereotypes interact with the sex of their child to directly influence the parents' beliefs about the child's abilities. In turn, parents' beliefs about their child directly influence their child's self-perceptions, and both the parents' stereotypes and the child's self-perceptions influence the child's performance. Stereotype threat is being at risk of confirming, as self-characteristic, a negative stereotype about one's group. In the case of gender it is the implicit belief in gender stereotype that women perform worse than men in mathematics, which is proposed to lead to lower performance by women. A review article of Stereotype Threat Research 2012 relating to the relationship between gender and mathematical abilities concluded, that although stereotype threat may affect some women, the existing state of knowledge does not support the current level of enthusiasm for this as a mechanism underlying the gender gap in mathematics. In 2018 Yolian A. Van Breen and colleagues conducted research into subliminal gender stereotyping. Researchers took participants through a fictional moral choice dilemma task, which consisted of eight scenarios in which sacrificing one person can save several others of unspecified gender. In four scenarios, participants are asked to sacrifice a man to save several others of unspecified gender, and in four other scenarios they are asked to sacrifice a woman. Quote, the results showed that women who identified as feminists were more willing to sacrifice men than women who did not identify as feminists. Quote, if a person wanted to counteract that and level the playing field, that can be done either by boosting women or by downgrading men, said Van Breen. So I think that this effect on evaluations of men arises because our participants are trying to achieve an underlying aim, counteracting gender stereotypes. Topic. Gender stereotypes and issues in the workplace Gender stereotypes are frequently brought up as one disadvantage to women during the hiring process, and as one explanation of the lack of women in key organizational positions. Management and similar leader positions are often perceived to be masculine in type, meaning they are assumed to require aggressiveness, competitiveness, strength and independence. These traits do not line up with the perceived traditional female gender role stereotype. This is often referred to as the lack of fit model which describes the dynamics of the gender bias, therefore, the perception that women do not possess these masculine 
qualities, limits their ability to be hired or promoted into managerial positions. One's performance at work is also evaluated based on one's gender. If a female and a male worker show the same performance, the implications of that performance vary depending on the person's gender and on who observes the performance. If a man performs exceedingly well he is perceived as driven or goal-oriented and generally seen in a positive light while a woman showing a similar performance is often described using adjectives with negative connotations. Female performance is therefore not evaluated neutrally or unbiased and stereotyped in ways to deem their equivalent levels and quality of work as instead of lesser value. Consequently, that gender stereotype filter leads to a lack of fair evaluation and, in turn, to fewer women occupying higher paying positions. Gender stereotypes contain women at certain, lower levels, getting trapped within the glass ceiling. While the number of women in the workforce occupying management positions is slowly increasing, women currently fill only 2.5% of the higher managerial positions in the United States. The fact that most women are being allocated to occupations that pay less, is often cited as a contributor to the existing gender pay gap. In relation to white women, women of color are disproportionately affected by the negative influence their gender has on their chances in the labor market. In 2005, women held only 14.7% of Fortune 500 board seats with 79% of them being white and 21% being women of color. This difference is understood through intersectionality, a term describing the multiple and intersecting oppressions an individual might experience. Activists during second-wave feminism have also used the term, horizontal oppressions, to describe this phenomenon. It has also been suggested that women of color in addition to the glass ceiling, face a concrete wall or a sticky floor. To better visualize the barriers, liberal feminist theory states that due to these systemic factors of oppression and discrimination, women are often deprived of equal work experiences because they are not provided equal opportunities on the basis of legal rights. Liberal feminists further propose that an end needs to be put to discrimination based on gender through legal means, leading to equality and major economic redistributions. While activists have tried calling on Title VII to provide an equal hiring and promotional process, that practice has had limited success. The pay gap between men and women is slowly closing. Women make approximately 21% less than her male counterpart according to the Department of Labor. This number varies by age, race, and other perceived attributes of hiring agents. A proposed step towards solving the problem of the gender pay gap and the unequal work opportunities is the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment which would constitutionally guarantee equal rights for women. This is hoped to end gender-based discrimination and provide equal opportunities for women. Topic. Economic and social consequences If a woman does act according to female stereotypes, she is likely to receive backlash for not being competent enough. If she does not act according to the stereotypes connected to her gender and behaves more androgynous, or even masculine, it is likely to cause backlash through third party punishment or further job discrimination. Therefore, women are expected to behave in a way that aligns with female gender stereotypes while these stereotypes are simultaneously used to justify their lack of success in an economic context, putting women in the workforce in a precarious, double bind situation. A proposed step to relieve women from this issue is the above mentioned ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment, as it would legally further gender equality and prohibit gender based discrimination regardless if a woman is acting according to female gender stereotypes or in defiance of them. Rosabeth Moss Condor identified four types of stereotypes given to professional women via the media. The four stereotypes are Iron Maiden, Pet, Mother, and Seductress, Sex Object. Iron Maiden refers to women who are deemed to display too many masculine traits and not enough feminine traits according to her audience. This leads audiences to question the trustworthiness of an Iron Maiden, because she is seen as strategically playing the field to appease voters. The pet stereotype is given to women who are identified as helpmates, cheerleaders, or mascots, which then leads the audience to see these women as naive or weak and unable to lead without a man's help. If a professional woman is seen as a mother, she is more likely to be seen as compassionate and caring, but also has the capacity to be shrew, punishing, and scolding. Additionally, it is possible for her leadership abilities to be called into question due to perceived conflicts with her maternal responsibilities. The fourth stereotype, seductress, is assigned to women who speak and act rather femininely, or have been victims of sexual harassment. 
The media tends to focus on the seductress woman's sex appeal and physical appearance in opposition to her policy stances and rhetoric. A proposed step to relieve women from that double bind is the above mentioned ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment, as it would further legal gender equality and prohibit gender based discrimination, regardless if a woman is acting according to female gender stereotypes or in defiance of them. Topic. Implicit gender stereotypes Gender stereotypes and roles can also be supported implicitly. Implicit stereotypes are the unconscious influence of attitudes a person may or may not be aware that they hold. A person is influenced by these attitudes even though they are not aware. Gender stereotypes can also be held in this manner. These implicit stereotypes can often be demonstrated by the Implicit Association Test IAT. One example of an implicit gender stereotype is that males are seen as better at mathematics than females. It has been found that men have stronger positive associations with mathematics than women, while women have stronger negative associations with mathematics and the more strongly a woman associated herself with the female gender identity, the more negative her association with mathematics. These associations have been disputed for their biological connection to gender and have been attributed to social forces that perpetuate stereotypes such as aforementioned stereotype that men are better at mathematics than women. This particular stereotype has been found in America American children as early as second grade. The same test with Singaporean children found that the strength of their mathematics gender stereotype and their gender identity predicted the association between individuals and mathematical ability. It has been shown that this stereotype also reflects mathematical performance. A study was done on the worldwide scale and it was found that the strength of this mathematics gender stereotype in varying countries correlates with eighth graders' scores on the TIMSS, a standardized math and science achievement test that is given worldwide. The results were controlled for general gender inequality and yet were still significant. Topic gender inequality online An example of gender stereotypes assumes those of the male gender are more tech savvy and happier working online. However, a study done by Harjitai and Schaefer shows that many women also typically have lower self perceived abilities when it comes to use of the World Wide Web and online navigation skills. Because this stereotype is so well known many women assume they lack such technical skills when in reality, the gap in technological skill level between men and women is significantly less than many women assume. In the journal article written by Elizabeth Bem Morovitz video games have been guilty of using sexualized female characters, who are revealing clothing with an ideal figure. It has been shown, female gamers can experience lower self-efficacy when playing a game with a sexualized female character. Women have been stereotyped in online games and have shown to be quite sexist in their appearance. It has been shown these kind of character appearances have influenced people's beliefs about gender capabilities by assigning certain qualities to the male and female characters in different games. The concept of gender inequality is often perceived as something that is non existent within the online community, because of the anonymity possible online. Remote or home working greatly reduces the volume of information one individual gives another compared to face-to-face -face encounters, providing fewer opportunities for unequal treatment but it seems real-world notions of power and privilege are being duplicated. People who choose to take up different identities avatars in the online world are still routinely discriminated against, evident in online gaming where users are able to create their own characters. This freedom allows the user to create characters and identities with a different appearance than their own in reality, essentially allowing them to create a new identity, confirming regardless of actual gender those who are perceived to be female are treated differently because of their online gender identity. In marked contrast to the traditional male-dominated stereotype a study shows that 52% of the gaming audience is made up of women and a minority of gaming characters are women. Only 12% of game designers in Britain and 3% of all programmers are women. Despite the growing number of women who partake in online communities, and the anonymous space provided by the internet, issues such as gender inequality, the issue has simply been transplanted into the online world. Topic. Politics and gender issues Topic. In political office Even though the number of women running for elected office has increased over the last decades, they still only make up 20% of U.S. Senators, 19.4% of U.S. Congressional Representatives and 24% of statewide executives. 
Additionally, many of these political campaigns appear to focus on the aggressiveness of the female candidate which is often still perceived as a masculine trait. Therefore, female candidates are running based on gender-opposing stereotypes because that predicts higher likelihood of success than appearing to be a stereotypical woman. Elections of increasing numbers of women into office serves as a basis for many scholars to claim that voters are not biased towards a candidate's gender. However, it has been shown that female politicians are perceived as only being superior when it comes to handling women's rights and poverty, whereas male politicians are perceived to be better at dealing with crime and foreign affairs. That view lines up with the most common gender stereotypes. It has also been predicted that gender does only highly matter for female candidates that have not been politically established. These predictions apply further to established candidates, stating that gender would not be a defining factor for their campaign or the focal point of media coverage. This has been disproven by multiple scholars, often based on Hillary Clinton's multiple campaigns for the office of President of the United States. Additionally, when voters don't have a lot of information about a female candidate, they are likely to view her as being a stereotypical woman which they often take as a basis for not electing her because they consider typical male qualities as being crucial for someone holding a political office. Topic. Feminism and women's rights Throughout the 20th century, women in the United States saw a dramatic shift in social and professional aspirations and norms. Following the women's suffrage movement of the late 19th century, which resulted in the passage of the 19th Amendment allowing women to vote, and in combination with conflicts in Europe, World War I and World War II, women found themselves shifted into the industrial workforce. During this time, women were expected to take up industrial jobs and support the troops abroad through the means of domestic industry. Moving from homemakers and caregivers, women were now factory workers and breadwinners for the family. However, after the war, men returned home to the United States and women, again, saw a shift in social and professional dynamics. With the reuniting of the nuclear family, the ideals of American suburbia boomed. Throughout the 1950s and 1960s, middle-class families moved in droves from urban living into newly developed single-family homes on former farmland just outside major cities. Thus established what many modern critics describe as the private sphere. Though frequently sold and idealized as perfect living, many women had difficulty adjusting to the new private sphere. Writer Betty Friedan described this discontent as the feminine mystique. The mystique was derived from women equipped with the knowledge, skills, and aspirations of the workforce, the public sphere, who felt compelled whether socially or morally to devote themselves to the home and family. One major concern of feminism, is that women occupy lower-ranking job positions than men, and do most of the housework. A recent October 2009 report from the Center for American Progress, The Shriver Report, A Woman's Nation Changes Everything tells us that women now make up 48% of the U.S. workforce and mothers are breadwinners or co-breadwinners in a majority of families. 63.3%, see figure 2, page 19 of the executive summary of the Shriver Report. Another recent article in the New York Times indicates that young women today are closing the pay gap. Luisita Lopez Torregrosa has noted. Women are ahead of men in education. Last year, 55% of U.S. college graduates were female. And a study shows that in most U.S. cities, single, childless women under 30 are making an average of 8% more money than their male counterparts, with Atlanta and Miami in the lead at 20%. While this study concerned American cities, a global trend is developing, and has now been termed the reverse gender gap. Feminist theory generally defines gender as a social construct that includes ideologies governing feminine, masculine, female, male appearances, actions, and behaviors. An example of these gender roles would be that males were supposed to be the educated breadwinners of the family, and occupiers of the public sphere whereas, the female's duty was to be a homemaker, take care of her husband and children, and occupy the private sphere. According to contemporary gender role ideology, gender roles are continuously changing. This can be seen in Londa Schiebinger's Has Feminism Changed Science, in which she states, "...gendered characteristics, typically masculine or feminine behaviors, interests, or values are not innate, nor are they arbitrary. They are formed by historical circumstances. 
They can also change with historical circumstances. One example of the contemporary definition of gender was depicted in Sally Shuttleworth's female circulation in which the, abasement of the woman, reducing her from an active participant in the labor market to the passive bodily existence to be controlled by male expertise is indicative of the ways in which the ideological deployment of gender roles operated to facilitate and sustain the changing structure of familial and market relations in Victorian England. In other words, this shows what it meant to grow up into the roles, gender roles of a female in Victorian England, which transitioned from being a homemaker to being a working woman and then back to being passive and inferior to males. In conclusion, gender roles in the contemporary sex gender model are socially constructed, always changing, and do not really exist since, they are ideologies that society constructs in order for various benefits at various times in history. Men's rights The men's rights movement MRM is a part of the larger men's movement. It branched off from the men's liberation movement in the early 1970s. The men's rights movement is made up of a variety of groups and individuals who are concerned about what they consider to be issues of male disadvantage, discrimination and oppression. The movement focuses on issues in numerous areas of society including family law, parenting, reproduction, domestic violence and government services including education, compulsory military service, social safety nets, and health policies that they believe discriminate against men. Scholars consider the men's rights movement or parts of the movement to be a backlash to feminism. The men's rights movement denies that men are privileged relative to women. The movement is divided into two camps, those who consider men and women to be harmed equally by sexism, and those who view society as endorsing the degradation of men and upholding female privilege. Men's rights groups have called for male-focused governmental structures to address issues specific to men and boys including education, health, work and marriage. Men's rights groups in India have called for the creation of a men's welfare ministry and a national commission for men, as well as the abolition of the national commission for women. In the United Kingdom, the creation of a Minister for Men analogous to the existing Minister for Women, have been proposed by David Amos, MP and Lord Northbourne, but were rejected by the government of Tony Blair. In the United States, Warren Farrell heads a commission focused on the creation of a White House Council on Boys and Men, as a counterpart to the White House Council on Women and Girls. Which was formed in March 2009. Related to this is the Fathers' Rights Movement, whose members seek social and political reforms that affect fathers and their children. These individuals contest that societal institutions such as family courts, and laws relating to child custody and child support payments, are gender biased in favor of mothers as the default caregiver. They therefore are systemically discriminatory against males regardless of their actual caregiving ability, because males are typically seen as the breadwinner, and females as the caregiver. <laughs> Gender neutrality Gender neutrality is the movement to end discrimination of gender altogether in society through means of gender-neutral language, the end of sex segregation and other means. Topic. Transgender and cross-dressing Transgender is the state of one's gender identity or gender expression not matching one's assigned sex. Transgender is independent of sexual orientation. Transgender people may identify as heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, etc. Some may consider conventional sexual orientation labels inadequate or inapplicable to them. The definition of transgender includes denoting or relating to a person whose sense of personal identity and gender does not correspond with their birth sex." People who were assigned a sex, usually at birth and based on their genitals, but who feel that this is a false or incomplete description of themselves. Non-identification with, or non-presentation as, the sex and assumed gender one was assigned at birth. While people self-identify as transgender, the transgender identity umbrella includes sometimes overlapping categories. These include transsexual, transvestite or cross-dresser, genderqueer, androgyne, and bigender. Usually not included are transvestic fetishists because it is considered to be a paraphilia rather than gender identification, and drag kings and drag queens, who are performers who cross-dress for the purpose of entertaining. 
In an interview, celebrity drag queen RuPaul talked about society's ambivalence to the differences in the people who embody these terms. A friend of mine recently did the Oprah show about transgender youth, said RuPaul. It was obvious that we, as a culture, have a hard time trying to understand the difference between a drag queen, transsexual, and a transgender, yet we find it very easy to know the difference between the American Baseball League and the National Baseball League, when they are both so similar. <laughs> sexual orientation Sexual orientation is defined by the interplay between a person's emotional and physical attraction toward others. Generally, sexual orientation is broken into the three categories, heterosexual, homosexual and bisexual. By basic definition, the term heterosexual is typically used in reference to someone who is attracted to people of the opposite sex, the term homosexual is used to classify people who are attracted to those of the same sex, and the term bisexual is used to identify those who are attracted to both the same and opposite sexes. However, some argue that sexual orientation is better defined as a continuum with those three categories represented. This idea was first proposed by sexologist Alfred Kinsey in 1948. After conducting a series of interviews, Kinsey and his team of researchers concluded that most people fell somewhere on a spectrum between strictly heterosexual and strictly homosexual. Their findings suggested that sexual orientation was more fluid than once believed. Sexual orientation is developed based on the three components of sexual identity, sexual behavior, and sexual attraction. Each component is independent, so no other conclusions can be drawn based on one another. An active conflict over the cultural acceptability of non-heterosexuality rages worldwide. The belief or assumption that heterosexual relationships and acts are normal is described as heterosexism or in queer theory, heteronormativity. Gender identity and sexual orientation are two separate aspects of individual identity, although they are often mistaken in the media, perhaps it is an attempt to reconcile this conflict that leads to a common assumption that one same-sex partner assumes a pseudo-male gender role and the other assumes a pseudo-female role. For a gay-male relationship, this might lead to the assumption that the wife handled domestic chores, was the receptive sexual partner, adopted effeminate mannerisms, and perhaps even dressed in women's clothing. This assumption is flawed because homosexual couples tend to have more equal roles, and the effeminate behavior of some gay men is usually not adopted consciously, and is often more subtle. Cohabitating same sex partners are typically egalitarian when they assign domestic chores. Sometimes these couples assign traditional female responsibilities to one partner and traditional male responsibilities to the other. Same sex domestic partners challenge traditional gender roles in their division of household responsibilities, and gender roles within homosexual relationships are flexible. For instance, cleaning and cooking, traditionally regarded by many as both female responsibilities, might be assigned to different people. Carrington observed the daily home lives of 52 gay and lesbian couples and found that the length of the work week and level of earning power substantially affected the assignment of housework, regardless of gender or sexuality. In many cultures, gender roles, especially for men, simultaneously act as an indicator for heterosexuality, and as a boundary of acceptable behavior for straight people. Therefore, lesbians, gay men and bisexual people may be viewed as exempt from some or all components of gender roles or as having different rules they are expected to follow by society. These modified rules for lesbian, gay and bisexual people may also be oppressive. Morgan examines the plight of homosexuals seeking asylum from homophobic persecution who have been turned away by U.S. customs for not being gay enough, not conforming sufficiently to standard Western conceptions of the gender roles occupied by gays and lesbians. Conversely, heterosexual men and women who are not perceived as being sufficiently masculine or feminine, respectively, may be assumed to be, or suspected to be, homosexual, and persecuted for their perceived homosexuality. Topic. Criminal justice A number of studies conducted since the mid-90s have found direct correlation between a female criminal's ability to conform to gender role stereotypes, particularly murder, and the severity of their sentencing. 
In terms of the social realities of justice in America, the experiences of diverse groups of people in society have contributed to the shaping of the types of criminals and victims that we have had. Like Anderson and Hill Collins in their discussion of what they refer to as a «matrix of domination», we too conceive that class, race, and gender represent multiple, interlocking levels of domination that stem from the societal configurations of these structural relationships. These patterned actions, in turn, affect ing individual consciousness, group interaction, and individual and group access to institutional power and privileges. Quote, quote, patterns of offending by men and by women are notable both for their similarities and for their differences. Both men and women are more heavily involved in minor property and substance abuse offenses than in serious crimes like robbery or murder. However, men offend at much higher rates than women for all crime categories except prostitution. This gender gap in crime is greatest for serious crime and least for mild forms of lawbreaking such as minor property crimes. Topic. Gender roles in family violence The family violence framework applies gender dynamics to family violence. Families are constructed around relationships that involve obligations and responsibilities, but also status and power. According to Hattery and Smith, when masculinity and femininity are constructed, to generate these rigid and narrow gender roles, it contributes to a culture of violence against women. People with more resources are more likely to be abusive towards those without resources, meaning that the stronger member of the relationship abuses their weaker partner or family member to exert their powerful roles. However, the fight for power and equality remains intimate partner violence in same-sex couples reveals that the rates are similar to those in the heterosexual community. Topic. See also Topic. References Topic. External links International Foundation for Gender Education Gender Pack Career Advancement for Professional Women Returners to the Workplace Men and Masculinity Research Center MMRC, seeks to give people especially men, across the world a chance to contribute their perspective on topics relevant to men e.g., masculinity, combat sports, fathering, health, and sexuality by participating in Internet-based psychological research. The Society for the Psychological Study of Men and Masculinity Division 51 of the American Psychological Association, SPSMM advances knowledge in the psychology of men through research, education, training, public policy, and improved clinical practice. Gender Stereotypes, Changes in People's Thoughts, a report based on a survey on roles of men and women. Gender Communication Barriers and Techniques, Strategic Communications, Stanford Graduate School of Business serves to help develop communication skills.